Hello, uh, my name is Jerry Johnson, and uh, we've done this a lot of times. It's good to see uh, Brother uh, Bomani back, uh, back here again. Uh, so for some of you all, you've already heard me explain uh, why I did the wall and all those kind of things. So we can just kind of start marching through some of the people on the wall. One thing I didn't mention when we were talking earlier is the reason that I chose the people I chose has to do with this, with the stories or the, the messages that I want to get to the children. So I, I basically took a lot of attributes that I wanted to talk about and then I started mapping people back to the attributes. So you'll see people you know. Uh, very well, people you expect to see and don't know, and people, of course, that you don't know, and, to, and you, you don't know why they're here until I talk about them. So let's uh, let's start cracking down here quick and see what, how far we can go in his feet. Uh, okay, Apoko Kanyani. Apoko Kanyani is a woman from the north of the country. Uh, they call them the, the Grunis, uh, you know, loosely known as Fra Fra. Uh, that's the group my wife comes from. They'll tell you in a minute that they're really not frafras. That's a corruption of a fara fara, which was a term that they used to use to each other, like welcome or you're working or whatever. And the Europeans heard it and they started saying frafra. So there's a whole group of people up there who are Grunis, who are uh, Talensi, who are Namdam, who are different groups, but they're all kind of labeled in terms of frafra. So she's uh, from a place called Bukeri in Bogatanga, where, where my wife and her people are from. She was famous for having used that pestle to having killed one of the, uh, the head slave trader uh, during the slave trading times. And so once she did that, the word got out that Bukeri and that area and her people were in a good place to really hunt for slaves because they had developed a, a, a history of some resistance. So she's a hero to her people there. Uh, Queen T of the 18th Dynasty, this is really where I start telling the students about ancient Kemet, Black Kemet being an African society and uh, trying to reorient them away from this Arabic or European, Europeanized uh, Egypt that they've all been taught in their history books and their Bibles. So Queen T of the 18th Dynasty, influential queen, mother of Akhenaten, um, and a few other things. <clears throat> then as you can see, front and center, when you first come in, you'll see Marcus Garvey. The reason I have Garvey here, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will or what you want to. As I, I mentioned earlier, I think Garvey had the template, Garvey had the idea. He said, a strong man is strong everywhere. And so his idea of building some power on this African continent, I think is as relevant today as it was when he said it even more so if you stay here and see how the configuration of power is here and in the world we know we have to have something. So that's Garvey. Most of the children will not have heard of the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, of course the largest black organization uh, in the world uh, in terms of just a political organization. Uh, then I have Kwame Nkrumah. Almost all of the students here will know Nkrumah because he was the father of the country, at least after the colonial era, era ended. But I put these words up here about um, Marx and Lenin. Uh, this is really even more for the teachers and the principals uh, to let them know that after Nkrumah says that after he read all of these so-called big brain Europeans, that the one that still did the most to uh, fire his enthusiasm was Marcus Garvey. So what that does is give some context to Marcus Garvey for people who don't know him, because they know Nkrumah, who is their national hero, uh, looks up to this man. Things like the Black Star Line and other, these all came from Garvey, although Nkrumah, of course, used them here in Ghana. So that's important. Uh, we happen to be in a place called Nuningo, which was originally called Karbu Kope. Well, Karbu is uh, the, the founder. Kope is like the town, so it's the town of Karbu. Karbu Kope. Uh, was the founder and then his first chief, Tejangma the first of the area we call New Lingo. Prom Prom, people think we're in Prom Prom, but it's really across the street and down the street. Uh, one of my flags, my Ghana flag came off. I got to refurb. Let me change out these flags now because they're wearing down. But this is Leia Zari, as I mentioned upstairs. It means welcome in Bruni or the Fafra language. Welcome to the ancestral wall.
rainy season comes, you start seeing some uh, this uh, this red, it's kind of a mildewy stuff which uh, we we scrape down and paint away. I'm gonna let it rain a few more times, real heavy, before I start chiseling all of that off. But uh, anyway, we start with Eve, uh, the mother of humanity. Uh, a lot of times, this one gets a lot of. Um, a lot of stress and strain because you know deeply Christian nation and then there's a lot of people who you know just for so many generations now have been taught Adam and Eve or these Europeans from whence we have all come uh, although we know that at least 200,000 years ago Homo sapiens sapiens which is our species came out of East Africa and then gradually uh, left Africa about 70,000 years ago populate the rest of the world I mean, for two-thirds of human history, there was no one in the world who was not in Africa. And I think the children need to know that. And now, they always have a lot of questions on how did they go from black to white, and I talk about the environmental factors and that kind of thing. That's Eve. Chenua Chebe, uh, Things Fall Apart, it was the most famous book, but, you know, Ann Hills is a Savannah, uh, Man of the People, has, of course, done a lot of writing. He's there because, to me, uh, he really gives a good picture in his stories about African culture and then how we responded uh, before and after the colonial period. Uh, someone mentioned Asa Hilliard. Uh, Asa Hilliard, when I was 19, I heard him say, do free your mind, return to the source. Although I was uh, always a black power oriented child, I never really understood the African side of it that well. <laughs> and uh, that was really blown away. And uh, he took the time to give me uh, a bibliography that he was writing up to start to read. This is like, you know, I was 19, so I'm 63 almost now, so this is how long ago that was. Ace has always put himself out for everybody to make sure we had access to everything. So Ace, uh, and then he was also in school as a chief down in the Cape Coast uh, area, central region of Ghana. Yeah, Santawa, you know, hear a lot about her, the queen mother of the Jisu, of course, who uh, was some of the motivation behind continuing the battle against the British for the Ashanti. Uh, if you go to Kumasi, you'll hear more about her. Uh, most Ghanaians, when they see the word Kimathi, uh, the only thing that comes to mind is, if they know the word, is Jerry Rawlings, who's our former president. His son was named Kimathi. This is the Kimathi that Jerry Rawlings named his son for, Didan Kimathi out of Kenya. You all remember we were growing up, they used to talk about the Mau Mau derogatorily. Uh, Mau Mau really is the Kikuyu or the Kenya Land Freedom Army. They're the ones, of course, we had to struggle against the, the British who were trying to take all of the best land and everything from the people there in Kenya. And he was the guerrilla warrior who fought them to the death. Even this picture is after he was captured, so you can see the defiance never left. Uh, in Zinga, uh, Mbande of Angola, uh, you know, when the Portuguese and the rest came through, they were in the Congo and uh, a little bit southern now it's called Angola, which Angola is uh, king. No, oh, yeah, king. Anyway, Nzinga was unlike some of the ones prior to her. She really dedicated her time and life and energy first to negotiate, but also at the end to fight the Portuguese because this whole enslavement process had totally gotten out of control, and she gave her time and energy to try to put a kibosh on that. Uh, Ejete, if you come from Ghana, you know Ejete was one of the three military men who uh, were shot at Christianburg <clears throat> back in 1948. Basically, they fought in World War II uh, for the British side and distinguished themselves in places like Burma where they ran most of the Japanese out of there. But it was time to get their due and their reparation. The British didn't want to come through, so they marched on the British. British Major shot one, shot the three of them. He was the leader of the three. That sparked the Accra riots, which was really the unraveling of the colonial order. Maurice Bishop. Uh, I know the, those of y'all who voted for Ronald Reagan. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't have. But, you know. Anyway, if it wasn't Reagan, it had been someone else because basically Maurice Bishop with the New Jewel movement down in Grenada was starting to show self-sufficiency. Sorry, you know, they had gotten their literacy rate up to just about 100%. And basically, the, the Americans said, last thing we need is a black Castro. And a, mm -hmm. So they just put the stomp on that very early and killed the revolution. But that was Maurice Bishop. 
a lawyer, wow. all of that. Uh, Amazon and the Namaton, these are the warrior sisters who fought against the French and were some, along with some of the frontline troops with Behanza and the, uh, the king of Dahomey. Uh, someone's told me that these um, uh, women in the uh, Black Panther movie were, were modeled after these Amazon uh, warrior women fighters in Benin. Edward Wilmot Blyden, um, one of the true fathers of Pan-Africanism, if you go back and look at some of his writings long before some of these other people were, were famous in the late 1800s. <clears throat> of course, he was born in the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, but he really distinguished himself uh, in Liberia, uh, starting colleges, uh, doing a lot of uh, political work. Uh, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race is probably his best known work, although he's written things like Africa for the Africans back in the 1800s. So he's really one of our intellectual fathers of Pan-Africanism. Steve Biko, this is a place because most of the children, I ask it every time, have you ever heard of apartheid? And they all go like this. So none of the children, none of the time, ever know about apartheid. And half of the teachers aren't even quite that sure. Wow. So and before I can even talk about Steve Biko, I have to explain what apartheid is in South Africa and what that's all about. I mean, we're in Africa and our African children have never heard of apartheid. It'd be something that they even said, yeah, you know, I heard that word. They heard the word. So this is how we're being uh, miseducated and, and mis-socialized. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, after I explain apartheid, then I can talk about black consciousness movement and things Biko is involved in in terms of anti-apartheid uh, activity. Oh, Sony Ali, I like to let them remember we had great West African uh, empires and kingdoms, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Songhai being the largest and the last of the, um, of the uh, West African <clears throat> empires. You know, he, sometimes the, the Arab Muslims who write about Sony Ali aren't very complimentary because he was known to have stuck to his African spiritual systems and just kind of gave lip service to the Islam. But you know, he had 14 major provinces that he had divided his country in, some four or 500 ships that plied the Niger River. Major, major uh, empire. Uh, Bahans and I just mentioned about him, they call him the Great Shark. I talk about him struggling against the French uh, during the colonial times. Uh, Mary Makiba, now they know a little bit about apartheid. So I tell them about her anti-apartheid struggles and how she was kicked out of the country for, for three decades. And of course, uh, being a very talented singer, performer, she was able to spread that anti-apartheid message around the world. She, and some people know she was also married to uh, Kwame Ture or a Stokely Carmichael for some time. Uh, the great Shekante Jop, which who was, uh, among other things, an uh, Egyptologist, a uh, uh, scientist, a uh, 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 historian, and just an all-around brilliant person, among other things, again, that people know him for is having proven pretty much beyond any doubt the blackness of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, the black Africanness of it. And of course, he used uh, all kind of historical references. Um, uh, he used eyewitnesses. He used all kinds of data, scientific data, to demonstrate that. Pretty much closed the books on it, but you wouldn't think so because every new set of books on Egypt that are given to children around the world still have these same uh, Arabic, European -ish looking characters doing all of these wonderful things. I don't care what they think, but it's a question of what our children know. And if our children think the same thing they think, then we're in big trouble. Yes. So we waiting on them to put that in the curriculum. Uh, I wouldn't do it. So if I'm in running the game and it's working, why am I going to change because it's not right. Mm -hmm. Black folks good for that. That's just not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it ain't right, but it's working. Mm -hmm. Dessalene, uh, of course, I get to talk about the Haitian Revolution and uh, him being one of the you know, main right-hand men of uh, Toussaint Louverture. And of course, he took over as, the, as well, established the formal Haiti. I like them to know that the word Haiti comes from Haiti, which was the original people, red people who were there before the Europeans came. Uh, so when the French came, of course, they called it Santa Domingue. When the Africans took it over, they gave the natives their name back in mm. Haiti. George Washington Carver, of course, the agricultural genius of the day. Really, no one even close to second. Mm. Go down to it. We've never been to Tuskegee and seen his uh, 
museum you have to go. Uh, Julius Nerere, uh, one of our great uh, leaders coming out of the colonial era, uh, highly competent in terms of just administrative and, and influence. Of course, he tried to build a polity around a certain kind of feeling. You know, these words that we have in Kwanzaa having to do with cooperative economics and unity and creativity, all of those Swahili words he was trying to put in practice in, in that new uh, Tanzania. He was also aware of the fact that they needed to, con to federate with a couple of other areas so they could have enough strength to have a block, but that didn't quite work out. And I also have him here because on top of this nice guy stuff, he also would provide a platform for some of the frontline state fighters to be trained and also to export their revolution. Uh, Ephraim Mamu, he's a man from the Volta region, from Piki. Uh, when I first read about him, I was so impressed just that he could see the onslaught of the European culture just trying to basically absorb everything. And, and, and so he stood up and said, no, our song and our clothes and our music and our instruments and our culture it has to stand strong. It has to stay front and center. And uh, so I was very impressed by how much energy he put into just maintaining the Africanness of our, you know, like I said, in the face of the cultural on onslaught. <coughs> Harriet Tubman, uh, this <laughs> is when I have to actually explain to the children about American slavery, mm -hmm. because believe it or not, it's not just something they know. Right. Because if you're not taught it, if you don't know, know it. Part that, eh? <laughs> you know, and so I have to explain to them a little bit about slavery in America and what she had to do in terms of trying to get people out. And I try to get here in a little bit of the brutality of the institution. Harriet Tubman. I always tell people when I come through here, once I was, you'll see this on another video, I'm sure, where the children were all gathered around, I was talking to them. Then I got down a little further and they were still talking among themselves. So I got a little irritated. I said, hey, 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 you know. And then the teacher was kind of in the middle of talking. I said, what's going on? And she said that when I was talking about Harriet Tubman, I mentioned slavery and I said, we had been all through this without being paid, blah, blah. They stuck on that, you know. So they start like, so you weren't paid? Hmm. You know, so just imagine, right. <laughs> you know, to the extent they think about you, us being over there, they think we even get checks every Friday right. for 400 years. Right. And no wonder they think we got money, you right. know. Right. That's a lot of money we done saved up. Right. We weren't getting paid. And they, the children didn't like that at all. They were like, no, that ain't gonna work. And we didn't either. That's what okay, some more of Michelle, uh, another one of these young freedom fighters uh, with uh, Frilimo struggling against the Portuguese also trained and, and launched his revolution out of southern Tanzania with the sponsorship of Nerere. He was knocked down in an airplane crash that we're almost sure was orchestrated by South African, white South Africans. Nanny of Jamaica. Nanny was uh, born in Ghana. I went over, you know, during the slave trade period. But she grew up to be such a powerful force there in Jamaica that the British ended up having to concede or cede a portion of the island to her you know, because he's a maroon, you know, they go in the, the mountains and they come down and they attack and they, you know, and just wreak havoc and then steal Africans, take them to freedom. They're in those, those, so they finally said, look, you keep this area, we won't bother you. And you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. I mean, that's how, how strong. And then there's a lot of uh, Jamaican, uh, a lot of Africans who've gone to Jamaica from this area. So when you go there, these names, Chermateng and mm -hmm. Champong, and then Kujo, who was the other uh, big <coughs> warrior rebel there, uh, mm -hmm. Maroon. These are all Akan names. Ali Selassie, of course, we know him mm -hmm. as uh, Rastafari, mm -hmm. uh, Leeds Rastafari, Makonan. Uh, it's kind of interesting that, depending on who comes here from Ethiopia, they either love him or they want to take their white paintbrush and paint over him. Mm -hmm. So. There's all that kind of things going on. Mm -hmm. you know? But, you know, he was one of the ones in the beginning of the OAU when the OAU looked like it may stand for something. Uh, Pianchi, uh, the 25th dynasty, ancient Kemet again. Uh, this is when, now this is 25 dynasties. A dynasty is basically a group of families who rule or families or relatives that rule for a long time. So we're 714 BC and of course uh, ancient Kemet goes back to 34, 3500 BCE, even longer. 
And so this just shows you how long we were in the system in terms of African pharaohs in these dynasties. Shaka, the great Zulu king, of course he consolidated a lot of territory. I always say if you're one of the people being overrun during that time, you may not like it, but at least they consolidated enough to where it was not easy, so easy for the Europeans to come in and have their way. Fannie Lou Hamer in the U.S., she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. This was the sisters now. The young Ghanaian children don't understand the idea that we couldn't vote. So I always try to tell them when I was a child, my parents, for practical purposes, couldn't vote. They said you can, but you know, in reality, you couldn't. And uh, then I told her about how she was beaten and tortured and, and mistreated, jailed, all for wanting just to have black people having the right to vote. That's hard for a lot of Ghanaian children to even fathom, right, you know, right. because they they think, you know, we're all Oprah and Obama, you know. <laughs> yeah. They figured Obama must have had the right to vote. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody. Uh, uh, my man uh, was talking about the spelling here of Togwe. Uh, this is a, well, let me just say who he was first. Togwe Sri the first was, he was the chief who basically brought the uh, Anlo people out of a place called Norche, which is in modern day Togo, down through the south of Togo and into, into southern Ghana. So when I ask a lot of the Ewe people here who, if I was gonna have an Ewe representative, this is the name I heard the most. That's why I put him up here. But he was, he was just uh, telling me about the spelling, T-O-G-B-U-I, which is a corruption. I think they just do T-O-G, uh, B E, Tugbe, uh, something like that. But we'll, I'll, I'll change that if I can get do a little research on it. Mm -hmm. I like these to be as close as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, Taki Tawia for the Gaz. He was the chief that most of the people said that they would like to see, or the person they would like to see up here. Of course, uh, the Sergeant Ajete, he was also a Ga. So I try to have the Ga, the Airways, and the Akans represented, and Northerners, as fairly as I can here, too. It's not just about, you know, across the world, but it's also across Ghana trying to get representation. So he was one of their real uh, powerful chiefs at the turn of the century, which he had to struggle against a new colonial order. Now here, what I usually do, I'll take a group of children and I'll have the students choose one child who looks most like him. And they always do. They pick one. They agree. And I have them stand there and they, usually we take pictures of them or something. The idea being that this African looks just like the Africans that are here today. And then I ask them who they think it is. And this, and this is, this is Narma, right? And this is another one I really need to change to Narma for Minis. But Minis and Narma, who was the first uh, pharaoh of the first dynasty of ancient Kemen or ancient Egypt. So all of these pictures that they're seeing of uh, Yule Brenner and Charlton Heston and all the rest of this stuff, and these movies are rampant around here. Um, I just like them to know that this boy who is here looks more like the first pharaoh of ancient Egypt than any of those white men you see on that movie. And, it, it, and they see it. They see it. Uh, they're, they're open to, open to believing it, receiving it. It's the teachers who kind of give me that. Now, now, you know, aren't we getting a, aren't we going a little far now? I done seen the movie four times. And then nobody look like that, you know. And I know they wouldn't deceive me in the movie. You know? So no, we, we, we got a long way to go. That's when we talk about getting control of our images and our socialization. It's all in there. Uh, Amakar Cabral, of course, was one of our greatest uh, thinkers, revolutionary, anti-colonial uh, fighters, writers. If you look at uh, Free Your Mind, uh, re Excuse me, <laughs> thinking of that. Return to the Source, uh, which is one of his great books. Uh, you know, he's unity and struggle. You have to read Cabral to understand what he did and how he used culture and everything to bring his people to a point where they got these Portuguese. Basically, they killed the Portuguese colonial experiment in Africa because it be became so expensive and they're losing people. It's kind of like Vietnam in the U.S. You lose so much money and you lose so many people, at some point the people back home say enough is enough. That's basically what happened in Portugal, and he was really more than anyone the reason for it.
Uh, Imhotep, I always do the same thing here. I get a student to stand next to Imhotep before I tell him who it is. And then we go into the fact he's the first world's first known multiple genius, world's first known medical doctor, astronomer, scribe, poet, all of the rest. And so that's the great multi-genius Imhotep. Toussaint Louverture, uh, my man painted this. He gave him a little a little too much of George Washington this time around. <laughs> but uh, we'll, 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 we'll tap that down here, uh, the, next, the next rev. And uh, of course, Toussaint Louverture. Now, the European does us a favor at one point because he, he gives us so much on Napoleon that you think Napoleon was just, could not be defeated or even approached. The food is ready? Okay, all right. I should have you out here doing this. Uh, the food is ready. But anyway, um, the thing here, the thing here about uh, all of the children, not all of them, but so many of them will have heard of Napoleon. Napoleon, you know, undefeated, the French general, Napoleon's army, and they teach them all of that nicely. And I say, anyone heard of Napoleon? And a good number of them will raise their hands, yeah. And I said, well, this guy sacked Napoleon. He beat Napoleon and kicked him out of Haiti. So the Africans could start their nation there, you know, independent republic. And, and that's how, you know, for them, that's a big thing. It's like, right. so Napoleon was, mm -hmm. hmm, mm -hmm. Well, maybe there's a chance. Maybe right. we can fight. Maybe we right. can stand. Maybe right. we have a history of something in right. it other than just being on our backs. Oh, yeah. I'm coming here and seeing this. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I think we'll get up here so the food okay. doesn't get cold. We can finish and do a speed walk through here after we eat if you feel like it. Okay. Or any way you want to go.